Good evening, welcome to our service. It's lovely to have you with us. Great to have some visitors this evening. Real, really warm welcome to you. Um, great. And uh, if you're watching online, apologies for our live stream situation at the moment. Um, we're working on it, but we haven't managed to solve it yet. So we, we hopefully uh, this will be uploaded afterwards, uh, recorded. Let me just briefly see if there's any notices for... Um, uh, for your attention. So David Knight and Linda and I will be at the Connection Conference this week from Monday to Wednesday. Uh, there's no Tuesday morning video and there's no railway outreach this week, uh, but there will be a prayer meeting in the site hall on Tuesday evening at 7.30. And don't forget clocks to go back, go back next week, though probably you'll have discovered it if you come to the evening service and not the morning service. Good, let's pray then, shall we, as we come to the Lord. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing on our worship this evening. We thank you uh, that we're able to come into this place and enjoy one another's fellowship and company. But we want, above all, to worship the living God. And we thank you that we can do so through the new and living way made for us by the Lord Jesus at the cross, giving himself for us, opening the way to heaven, opening the way to the holy presence of you, the eternal God, and enabling us to come safely and to draw near to you and to be comforted in you and to take shelter under your wings. So we thank you for that, Lord God, and pray your blessing on our time together. We pray that you'd speak to us from your word. We pray you'd encourage us in our singing. We pray for your Holy Spirit, as we thought this morning. We pray for your Spirit to descend and be with us this evening, so that at the end of our time, we will know that you have certainly been with us and blessed us. So, Father, we look to you. Lord Jesus, we look to you. Amen. Let's stand and sing our first uh, hymn this evening, then. O for a thousand tongues to sing. Uh, and it's uh, it's got the line, his blood can make the foulest clean, which is sort of along the theme of our service this evening. Let's stand then as the music starts.
come to God in prayer just, uh, in a moment. We'd like to turn in, uh, before we do, to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. It's on page 1018 in the Black Bibles. I'll just read the first few verses of this, 2 Peter chapter 1. It's a passage about making our calling and election sure, which was uh, Peter's last wish, as it were. This is his last thing he writes uh, shortly before his death. He wants those left behind to make their calling and election sure. So let me read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, that's with the apostles, by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to or by his own glory and excellence, by which he's granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. Let's turn to God in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come before you then and we rejoice in the very great and precious promises that you have for us in your word. Father, we are just normal, everyday believers, those of us who love and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have very great and precious promises that you have made to us and that we struggle to get into our minds We pray that as we look into your word this evening that you would just open up glorious vistas of of truth to us, uh, of encouragement, of comfort and reassurance to believers, as well as words of challenge. We thank you that uh, we have a faith of equal standing with the apostles. We stand on the same level ground as they do, and that of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, as verse 2 says, that grace would be multiplied to us, grace and the peace of the gospel, that we would know the mercy that you've shown us in greater vividness, greater power, greater light, so that our joy would increase and the fervor of our Christian walk would increase and our zeal to walk in godliness and holiness and get rid of all corruption from our lives. Father, we pray that you would do this and and give us a a burning zeal to live for Christ who gave himself for us. We pray, as we thought this morning, we pray for your Holy Spirit, not just on ourselves, for our own comfort and sanctification, but we pray for your Holy Spirit too on our world, desperately dry and, and barren. We pray that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit in our town, We pray you'd bless all the evangelistic efforts of all the churches in our town to reach out with the gospel. We pray that we would see fruit from that. We pray that we would see people turning from darkness to light, coming um, into the light of, of, of the kingdom of your beloved Son and coming with great thankfulness to you at this great mercy of the gospel. So we pray, Father, that you'd cause the gospel of Christ to speed forwards and progress and to gain new territory, for the gates of hell to be able to uh, not withstand the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. Now that we think of our own political situation in the UK at this current time, no doubt of concern to many, We thank you that you reign over all things. We thank you that you are sovereign over all 
the affairs of both heaven and earth. So we praise you that the, the, the national scene, the international scene are all within your hands. You know history in advance. You have your hand, your controlling sovereign hand over history, over the future and the present, as well as the past. So we thank you for that. We pray that you would raise up a new leader for our country. Uh, we pray that we would have a leader better than we deserve as a nation. Father, we would pray for believers in places across the world where to follow Christ is to suffer. We think particularly of believers in China at this time. We see the regime of uh, the current leader, Xi Jinping, and it's a hard line one, and it must be very, very hard for Christians under that regime. So we pray, Father, we bring that nation before you. We thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you that you have been pouring out your spirit on that nation for the last 30 plus years. And there's been great revival over that time. Many people turning to Christ in repentance and faith. And we thank you for that. We pray that you would defend and protect and bless and encourage the believers there. And that they would stand firm through the trials that they are enduring at this present time. Thank you that you bring down rulers as well as raise them up. And so, Father, we pray that there would be uh, greater freedoms in China than there are currently. We thank you that there have been in recent years greater freedoms. We pray that you would bring that to that nation again. But until then, enable the believers there to stand firm, we pray. And we pray for that for other places across the world too where Christians are suffering for the name of Jesus, losing their families, their their livelihoods, and maybe in their lives in some cases. Father, bless your church. Enable us to stand firm. Enable us to, in our own nation, to stand firm no matter what happens, no matter what comes our way. May we not crumble and cave in to the forces around us, but may we stand firm in Christ and in the truth of your word. Father, we thank you for seeing Eunice and Akin in our midst this morning after... A uh, several months of, of absence, especially Eunice with um, her nausea and sickness. So we praise you, Heavenly Father, uh, for them being with us this morning. And we just pray your blessing on that couple and on their current situation, and uh, on particularly on Eunice's well-being. And we pray that that would stabilize and that uh, she would uh, be free of all that, that she's been beset by over the past weeks. And finally, Father, we would just lift before you um, missionaries that we support in Moldova, Evelina and Vasily and their little baby Damaris. Uh, we thank you so much for this family. We pray your blessing and protection on them. Uh, we pray that you would lead them into the good works that you've prepared in advance for them to do. Uh, we pray that you give them joy in serving the Lord. We pray for their move to the uh, Chisinau, the capital city there. Uh, we pray for them to settle into their new situation as a family of three. So bless them abundantly. We thank you for them. Thank you for their love for you and your work in their lives. And may they see that fruit from their labors, we pray. So we bring our prayers, Father, in the great name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing together again. Amazing grace.
So we'd like to turn in your Bibles then to our main passage, which is Leviticus chapter 14, on page 92. Leviticus chapter 14, verses 1 to 20, is what we'll be reading. Uh, Okay, Leviticus chapter 14, verses 1. Let me just pray before we read. Heavenly Father, this is your word. We thank you for it. We want to humble ourselves before it, even though this passage is probably one that we don't read very often, and maybe there are many things in here that puzzle us. But we pray, Father, that we'd receive glorious, wonderful things from you this evening as we see this passage pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel and our redemption in him. And we pray that uh, you'd open our eyes to the truth of the things contained in our passage and the helpfulness and wonderful uh, beauty of the things here for us. Father, we thank you that you've been with us uh, so evidently in our series in Leviticus so far. We look to you, Father. We look to you to give us your Holy Spirit and to give us good understanding of your word now and to bless it to us. So we pray these things. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Leviticus chapter 14 then, verses 1 to 20. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then, if the case of leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. Hyssop is a plant. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water or running water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe himself in, in water and he shall be clean. And after that he may come into the camp, but shall live outside his tent for seven days. And on the seventh day he shall shave off all his hair from his head, his beard and his eyebrows. He shall shave off all his hair, and then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and he shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall take two male lambs without blemish, and one ewe lamb, a year old, without blemish, and a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, and one log of oil. A log is not a log, it's a log, and this is a measure. It's about between half a pint and a pint of, of oil in this case. Verse 11. And the priest who cleanses him shall set the man who is to be cleansed and these things before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it for a guilt offering along with the log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And he shall kill the lamb in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering, in the place of the sanctuary. For the guilt offering, like the sin offering, belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the right thumb of his right uh, sorry and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot then the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand and dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand and sprinkle some oil with his finger seven times before the lord and some of the oil that remains in his hand the priest shall put on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot, on top of the blood of the guilt offering. 
and the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. Then the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. The priest shall offer the sin offering to make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. And afterwards he shall kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall, kill the, uh, shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be clean. Now this follows on from last week, if you were with us in chapter 13. There in chapter 13 we saw instructions on how an Old Testament priest, under that Old Testament um, dispensation of God's, uh, uh, of God's working in history, uh, how the Old Testament priest was to diagnose a case of leprous disease. And we saw that leprous disease en- encompassed a lot of um, broad things, so n- skin diseases of all sorts, but not even just human diseases. It would cover also um, mold in, in garments and cloth, and also later in our chapter, uh, it also includes uh, rottenness, mold in housing as well, in buildings. So it's a broad term. And last week we saw how the Old Testament priest was to uh, diagnose a case uh, of such a disease as this that was then deemed unclean uh, for which a person, if they had this sort of disease, they had to live apart, an outcast, away from the community of God's people. Now this week's passage is for the situation where a person who had such a disease as that and who had been therefore thrown out and been an outcast, um, basically lived this living death of leprosy outside uh, of the camp of God's people, where such a person is healed. Now this passage isn't about the, how a person gets to be healed. This is for a person who has already been healed, and it's how they're to be readmitted, restored, into the community of God's people. The priest was to go and examine them, and if they're truly healed, then this passage gives the procedure, and it's, a, it's a, an involved complex procedure, isn't it, as to how someone was to be readmitted and restored into God's people. And if we were to read on verses 21 to 32, there we'd see a very similar passage, uh, but this is for people who are too poor to afford um, the three lambs, for example, that were in our passage. So that's uh, how it goes on in, in the middle of the chapter. In other words, then, if last week was bad news, and I think it really was, it was, uh, look at verses 45 and 46, this person had to, Uh, tear their clothes and cry out, unclean, unclean, and live alone, be outside the camp. Well, this chapter 14 is good news. This is about someone being readmitted to the presence of God's people. This is a wonderful good news. Now, I want you to note at the outset, and and this is really key for for the passage's relevance to us, is that Jesus refers to our passage this evening. He refers to Leviticus chapter 14, in, uh, well, various places, but we're going to look at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 is on page 837. Uh, We read this last week, but we'll just read it again to see something slightly different in it. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 44. And a leper came to Jesus, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. If you're willing, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I'm willing, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them, for a proof to the people. Now, when Jesus says about what Moses commanded in verse 44, that's our passage. That's Leviticus chapter 14. So Jesus here in this passage in Mark 1, he wonderfully heals this man riddled with this horrible leprosy. The skin's in tatters, the flesh is a mess. And Jesus wonderfully heals this man, as we saw last week, with a touch. Uh, he, amazing power going out from Jesus as he touches this man. There's no contamination to Jesus. Rather, there's power going out from Jesus to heal this man. 
And then, having been healed, this man is then instructed to go to the priest and follow the procedure of Leviticus chapter 14. All the, all the involved things that we're just going to look at in just a moment. Now, I wonder how many times has the passage that we're looking, or our passage, Leviticus chapter 14, ever been carried out? And I thought through the cases of um, leprosy that there were in the Old Testament, and I, I, it wasn't obvious to me that there was a single one where there was, a passage was carried out following someone's healing, because there aren't that many people who recover from leprosy in the Old Testament. There's Miriam, Numbers chapter 12. Possibly the procedure of our carry, passage is carried out, but it's, it's not entirely clear, uh, but it, it's, it's possible in Numbers 12. You can look at that in your own time if you want to. Uzziah, though, he's leprous to his death. Gehazi, it seems, is leprous to his death and beyond to subsequent generations. Naaman, the uh, Gentile, well, he, he, he doesn't come back into God's people because he never was part of God's people in the first place. Um, but he, he, he goes back to Syria, so there's no apparent uh, following the passage for him, although he does seem to be converted. So I'm struggling to think of any time in the Old Testament uh, when our passage was carried out. It may have been that we're just not told about one. But it's entirely possible, on the other hand also, maybe that it's only in the New Testament when Jesus heals lepers that our passage is carried out. Because it was an awesome thing for a leper to be healed. You can see in, um, there's a verse, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 7, uh, where uh, that's the passage of Naaman. And you can see there that um, the healing of a leprous man was considered to be equivalent to raising the dead. That's how powerful an act it was. That's how unlikely, naturally speaking, an act it was. So I wouldn't be surprised if the real first healings of leprosy come in the New Testament with the power of Jesus touching lepers, making them clean and well. But even if that's not the case, even if there were healings in the Old Testament, nonetheless, we see from Jesus' words here in Mark chapter 1 that it's a testimony to Jesus. Our passage, in all its procedures, is a testimony to Jesus. Because he says that. He says in verse 44, doesn't he? Uh, go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them or for a testimony to them, it literally says. So Jesus intends our passage to be taken as a testimony to him and his saving power. And might it not also be that not only by the sheer fact of Jesus' power, healing lepers, might it not also be that the complex details of our passage also speak and testify to the Lord Jesus Christ and his saving work as well. And I think that must be the case. Surely God did not put all those complicated details of our passage, which we just read a, you know, one part of. Um, surely he didn't put it there just haphazardly. God is not haphazard. God did all of that with an eye to the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, saving people, saving people riddled with sin in their lives. And so I think that there is Christ to be seen in the details of our passage. And so that's what I want to go through with you this evening. Four things then I want to go through. First of all, the gospel in the cedar and the other things mentioned, but particularly the cedar. Secondly, the gospel in the two birds. Those two things are sort of looking at the first half of our passage because it's really in two stages that the cleansing of the leper takes place. And then, so thirdly, we're looking at stage two now. There's further reassurance coming there. And then finally, there's a note of challenge. And so those last two points are really in stage two of the leper's cleansing. So let's first look at the gospel in the cedar wood. So let's consider the, what do we have then? The cedar wood, the scarlet yarn, and the hyssop. And we see those mentioned uh, in verse 4, the priest shall command them to take for him to be, who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and cedarwood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. We'll move on to the two clean birds at the moment, but just look at the cedarwood, scarlet yarn and hyssop. Now, I'm just going to offer very tentatively an interpretation to this, and I do so um, in collaboration, as it were, with commentators I've read. But I just want to offer this very tentatively. I only really like to interpret God's word carefully and where there is really good solid grounds for something um, and so uh, 
I'm feeling a slight lack of that this evening, but nonetheless, given that other commentators uh, can see these things as well, it, I, I offer these things with all of those uh, caveats in place, okay? So this is a maybe and a possibility. What is it about cedarwood? Well, you won't find this in the pages of the scriptures, as far as I can see. Um, but the cedarwood, it seems, has a very a, a property of being very resilient to decay. One of the commentators I read, his, uh, one of his ancestors' graves, gravestones was made of cedarwood, back from the 1780s, I think it was. And he said the gravestone was just in good nick now as it was when he was, it was first put up. Cedarwood's very resistant to decay, as opposed to leprosy, of course, which is, in its very nature, decayed flesh. Horrible, isn't it? That's what it is, decayed flesh on a living person. Cedarwood, though, was resistant to decay. What about hyssop mentioned here? Well, hyssop, uh, it's mentioned in the Bible, is, is maybe things that we're actually really familiar with. Things like mint and thyme and marjoram and uh, what's the other one? Sage. Things that you probably have in your cupboard at home. Things that are fragrant. Things that are nice to smell. In the Bible, hyssop is associated with cleansing. Psalm 51 verse 7. Purge me or cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. So hyssop has those sort of connotations. And then scarlet yarn. Again, this is a very tentative uh, uh, interpretation. Scarlet yarn possibly stood for healthy blood. Healthy blood returning Having, well, having returned to the person who's been made well from leprosy. Now, as I say, I'm very hesitant about being, being too dogmatic about these things, but it may be that these things represent the soundness of the healing that Lord Jesus provides um, in, the, in his saving work. And maybe, this, maybe the cedar in particular points to our resurrection life when we are raised imperishable. We have these bodies, don't we, that which are uh, in a gradual state of degenerating all of us. We gradually get older and our bodies decay over time and uh, well, degenerate and age and get more prone to disease, don't they? Get weaker. But one day we'll have bodies that are imperishable. And that's the nature of the work that Jesus has done. It's an imperishable. One Peter talks about an inheritance that is imperishable and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So the final state of a person saved by the Lord Jesus Christ is incorruptible wholeness. A wholeness that can never again fall into the degeneracy that our, uh, our, nature, our uh, mortal natures did when, um, well, our, our first natures did when Adam and Eve uh, sinned in the garden. They sinned and we fell. There'd be no possibility when we're raised of ever falling into sin again. There's no possibility of a Genesis 3 happening all over again. We're raised imperishable, incorruptible. That's good news. Now whether the cedar speaks of that or not, may do, may not. But 1 Corinthians 15 certainly teaches us that we're raised imperishable. That's Christ's work for us. No further fall into the decay and rottenness and death. Secondly, then, the gospel in the two birds. Let me read verses 5 to 7. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh or running water. He shall take the live bird with the cedarwood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall, shall let the living bird go into the open field. Again, some strange things to our ears here, but maybe actually a beautiful depiction of the gospel. A mini drama that points to Christ and to us. Do you see then, first of all, that the, um, the bird, now you've got two birds, one's to be killed and the other is to be dipped in the blood of a killed bird and then released. So the one that's to be killed is to be killed in an earthenware vessel, it says. Well, didn't Christ come to occupy an earthenware vessel like ours? A, a body of clay, a body like ours that was prone to frailty and to being broken. 
And he did that in order for his body to be given on the cross, to shed his blood for us, to be bruised for our iniquities. And are we not baptized into Christ, those of us who believe? We are, as it were, dipped in his blood. We're dipped into Christ, as it were, just like the second bird. And we, that's in order for us to be saved, baptized, dipped in Christ. And then do you see how the, the blood-dipped bird is then set free into the open field? I think it's a wonderful picture of both the new life that a healed leper had, released from their bondage to decay, and it's also a wonderful depiction of our new life in Christ, those of us who love him and trust him. Now, some commentators think that the live bird represents the risen Lord Jesus. Uh, fine, okay, happy with that. If so, that doesn't change things one little bit, actually, from what I've said. Because when Christ was raised, we were raised with him. Ephesians chapter 2, we've been made alive with him, those of us who believe. We've been given new birth through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. So then as this bird is released, it, it, it either represents us dipped in Christ and this new life that we have in Christ, or it represents Christ himself resurrected, still bearing the marks of his own death. But either way, it points to the same thing, because believers are united to Christ in his resurrection. We're united in his death and his resurrection. And so either way, whether this bird depicts us or Christ, it's the same thing, because we're united with Christ. And so our freedom is the freedom of being united to him in his resurrection. As Christ rises from the dead, as, he's, as he ascends to heaven, he flies free of our sin and death. He bore our sin. It was all laid on him at the cross. He bore our sin and death at the cross. He pays for it all. He rises again, free of it. And then literally flies, ascends to heaven, victorious over all the sin and death that he bore for us. Now I have, I have two commentators on this that, that really, uh, uh, I think, do, do a great job of this. Matthew Henry I've got. I'm kicking myself that I forgot to bring my other commentary. Uh, sitting at home somewhere. Uh, I don't know, I'll have to email it around or something. Uh, but anyway, let me read the Matthew Henry on this particular thing, on this uh, the, this live bird dipped in the blood of, of the yeah, killed bird. Matthew Henry says this, This typified that glorious liberty of the children of God to which those are advanced who through grace are sprinkled from an evil conscience. Those whose souls before bowed down to the dust, Psalm 44 verse 25, in grief and fear, now fly in the open firmament of heaven and soar upwards on the wings of faith and hope and holy love and joy. Yes, I like that. Andrew Bonar was even better. I'm really kicking myself. I didn't bring him, uh, but it was good. Uh, but just think of that, the, the live bird that represents us in Christ, uh, freed from our guilt and sin, freed from our death. And one day uh, that will be reality. We will meet the Lord in the air and be with him forever in the glory to come. Now, we haven't thought about the running water. I'm just briefly mentioning that. That's in verses 5 and 6. Uh, running water will hopefully, those of you who were here this morning, will immediately think of things like Ezekiel 47, where running water depicts um, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the literal phrase is living water. That's the Hebrew way of speaking of uh, a fresh supply of water that, that, that runs, as opposed to a stagnant pool. And that represents that this running water, this living water represents the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. And you can see that particularly made clear in John chapter 7, verse 38. And so uh, Christ and the Holy Spirit are, are, are both written across all the procedures um, in this passage. Christ in the blood and the sacrifices and, uh, and in the life of the bird and the Holy Spirit in the living water and also 
in the oil as well, which comes in the second part. Let's, let's move on to the second stage then. We've looked at two points from the first stage of the procedure. We looked at the, the cedar, possibly speaking of the imperishable nature of, of the uh, salvation that Jesus has uh, redeemed us into. And then secondly, the, the beautiful live bird flying free. And let's move, let's move on to our third point then, which is some further reassurance. Uh, let me read for this. Uh, this is really going to be for points three and four. Let me read verses 12 to 18 again. And the priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it for a guilt offering along with the log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And he shall kill the lamb in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering and in the place of the sanctuary. For the guilt offering, like the sin offering, belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand, on the big toe of his right foot. Then the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand and dip his right finger in the oil that is in the left hand and sprinkle some oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And some of the oil that remains in his hand the priest shall put on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and the big toe of his right foot on top of the blood of the guilt offering and the rest of the oil and he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. Then the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. Now leprosy made you an outcast away from the presence of the Lord and it resulted from the fall and it really symbolized the fall and it symbolized our corruption and sin. We saw that last week and our banishment from God. But this procedure that we're seeing here uh, which is to be for- performed on a leper who's been cleansed of their disease gave every indication of the complete reversal of all of that uh, exile and banishment and, and, and uh, outcast and our presentability to, to God. This is what this speaks about here. Our presentability to God through Christ and the cross and our acceptance before God. Do you see verse 12 talks about a wave offering? So the guilt offering there is to be waved for a wave offering before the Lord. In other words, it's to be presented before the Lord in a very tangible sort of way. Now, obviously, God sees everything that goes on. He sees all that happens. He doesn't really need to have things waved in front of him, but this is surely for the comfort and reassurance of the person who's being cleansed from their leprosy, the person who's being declared clean of it, that this wave offering is waved before the Lord. And so that is waved, and also this, uh, this measure of oil. And you see how the oil, after... Uh, being used for some things we'll come on to in a minute, was poured on the head of the healed leper in verse 18. And you just think what this would mean to a leper, someone who'd been um, outside of, of God's community of people, uh, an outcast, unclean, for years and years and years, uh, utterly unpresentable to anyone, let alone to God. But here, these sacrifices the waving of these things, the presenting to God of these things, uh, really uh, are a great encouragement because they speak about this person becoming presentable again to God. They can draw near to God. They'll be fully accepted. They've been cleansed. They've been made fully presentable to God again. And so these were visual aids, surely, for their comfort. And if for their comfort, then for ours too in Christ. They speak of our presentability in Christ before God. Do you feel the corruption of your heart and and your sin? I hope from time to time, certainly you do. Otherwise, uh, we can't really trust in Christ if we don't feel our sin, do we? And even as believers, we we still have this experience of feeling our sin and needing to uh, again express our dependence on Christ. So when we have those moments of feeling our sin, feeling our guilt before God, then something like this uh, is here for our comfort. And it speaks of the fact that we are presentable to God in Christ. 
Of course, without Christ, we're totally unpresentable. Totally wouldn't be accepted at all. But if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you go through those dark times when you, you feel that your sin is closing in on you and, and weighing down on you, then this speaks of your acceptance. The waving before the Lord, presenting before the Lord, the pouring on the head of the oil. These are all uh, to, to show the restoration, to show the presentability of this person, not just to the covenant community, but to God himself. So the Lord wants his redeemed to know and be comforted by these things, to know that we're accepted by him, presentable to him. And then finally and fourthly, consider the, um, the strange thing of the earlobe and the thumb and the big toe. So we have in verses 14 and 17 the fact that, uh, firstly, sacrificial blood is to be uh, smeared on the earlobe, the right thumb and the right big toe, and then oil, similarly, put on the same three places. And on first sight, again, this seems very strange and alien to us. And yet think of the important functions of those parts of the body. Hearing, doing, working with our hands, walking with our feet. And so one commentator writes this, the smearing of blood and oil on representative parts of the person's body indicates that atonement touches every area of one's life and warns us against hearing, doing, or walking in the ways of anything that would separate us from fellowship with God. So yes, we're redeemed to forsake the defilement and the corruption of sin and instead to pursue godliness by the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit. So we have these very great and precious promises that as, as Tobita speaks about. And also, we are to escape the corruption that's in the world and still in our nature. We're to escape corruption and pursue godliness by the Holy Spirit in us. And you can think of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We're to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God, holy and acceptable to him, devoted to him, consecrated to his service. And as we think about these parts of the body, and it seems very strange to us, well, let's apply it to us in a way that we can understand. This morning we thought about baptism, didn't we? The baptism of John the Baptist that he was doing in the Jordan River. Well, if you've been baptized into Christ by full immersion, then the symbolism that's entailed in this chapter is applicable to us too. Because your earlobe got wet too. Your right thumb got wet too. Your big toe got wet too, along with all the rest of you. And so the symbolism is there too. The whole of you got baptized when you were baptized in Christ. Earlobes, thumbs, the lot, the whole of our bodies devoted to the Lord now. We've been washed, we've been cleansed, we're now consecrated and devoted to the Lord in every part, in every area of our lives, in every aspect of our, of our existence. And so the point is, we've looked at three things that reassure us. The imperishability of our life to come. Uh, the glorious freedom that we have in Christ, like that bird flying free. And we've looked at our presentability and acceptability to God. And if you're a believer in Christ and draw comfort from those things, you need to hear, and I need to hear, the fourth thing too, which is the challenge that we are to live our lives now in every part, in our hearing, in our actions, in our going, every part we are to live our lives devoted to the Lord who gave himself for us. So let me close with two passages that link the promises of the gospel to the call to purity and holy living. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. If you take comfort from promises, the promises of the gospel, then let that drive you to seek to live a pure life by the power of the Holy Spirit in you. And then secondly, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are, so you are, if you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from all the corruption and depth of your sin. You're a child of God. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. 
Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we shall see him as he is. So two verses of precious promises, and then verse 3. 1 John 3, verse 3. And everyone who thus hopes in Christ purifies himself as he is pure. So there's a challenge to us. Are we seeking to draw comfort from the gospel, draw comfort from Christ without pursuing a life of godliness, a life of fleeing from sin? That cannot be. The two things have to go together. On the one hand, the drawing comfort from the gospel, from the glorious gospel in all its aspects, and the other aspect, and and with that has to go the pursuit of a life uh, of ridding ourselves of sin and of growing in godliness and purity. Well, may the Lord uh, encourage us in these things and also uh, direct us to live for him. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, as we emerge from this difficult passage of Leviticus, we pray that those things that are true and right would stick with us. We thank you for the great work of Jesus Thank you for that power he exerted, touching lepers, cleansing them of their leprosy, and of the testimony that our passage was to give uh, to the fact of the power of Christ and his saving work. Father, we pray that those who are true believers in the Lord Jesus, who fled to him for refuge from their sin and from your judgment, those of us who've done that, would would first of all draw comfort from your very great and precious promises in all their aspects, and that we would enjoy doing that as we uh, read our Bibles and spend time with you in prayer over this coming week ahead. May we draw great comfort personally for ourselves from the gospel in Jesus. And may we also not neglect to purify ourselves as he is pure, to cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to corruption, uh, to, to completion, sorry, in the fear of God. So help us then, comforted and blessed in the Lord Jesus and in the great promises of the gospel to pursue a life of living for him in every part. We pray in his name. Amen. Let's close our service this evening then with our final song, Jesus the Name, High Over All. Let's stand as the introduction starts. Yeah, sorry, that's this morning's, wasn't it? Yes, it's love divine. You're right, thank you.
So we pray then, Heavenly Father, that you'd go with us as we go into the rest of this week ahead uh, in all, all the different things that are ahead of us, some of which we know about, others we may not. May we live for Christ. We pray that we would be filled with comfort and joy in him and live for him in every part. Give us strength, give energy to those who are lacking it, give uh, help to those who need it. Father, bless our fellowship and and, uh, following of you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.